Hello, you hardcore boxing fans out there. How are you doing? It's Big P here, but you already know that, don't you? That's why you've tuned in. I'm joined today by Terry from London. How are you doing, Terry? Mate, what a, what a 24 hours. That's the yeah. way to describe it. What a 24 hours. Yeah, I know. What do you think? Um, so, so, I already, so, so I've done my episode on this already, Russ, and my main message was... The chickens came home to roost. Now, I'll go back to what I've always said. I think Dubois is a special talent. Like, But you get to a certain age. And I think after the age of 22, I can't call you a talent anymore. You've got to start showing you've got levels. And we, we haven't really seen that over the last year. So I was wondering why we hadn't. But then you go through his list of opponents, right? And you go, how much, how much do I think Frank Warren has spent on opponents for, for Daniel Dubois? And I don't think it's more than 200 grand. Yeah. So that's not an investment for me. Like, if you really want him to be headlining pay per views and having fights with the likes of Joshua, you've got to be getting him top quality opponents. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. You've got to invest in him. You've got to, you've got to have a lad like Dubois in camp with Fury, full time. You've got to have him in camp full time with. He's been sparring so, up at Peters when I've been there. But he's never been in camp. He comes for a couple of days and goes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That's but you can't like he, he needs he needs that. He needs to be around guys who are better than him. Yeah. Like that that's how you develop. You don't get better by fighting guys you can already beat. And I think he's had too much of that. Like I'll give you a point, right? Do you mean, a year like, ago, do you mean, do you mean sorry, do you mean like David Adelaide, he come he were coming and doing camps? Do you mean like what David were doing? That's how you learn. Yeah, you yeah. mean like week, you know, week in, week like, out. Seven yeah. week, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just get that get that that rhythm and that feel and you're picking up what Pete is saying and you're asking questions. Why are you doing that? Why are you doing this? And yeah. you're getting your own knowledge. Yeah. That's what they should have been doing with him. Look, here's here's the, the most damning sight of it, right? How when did he fight Richard Larty? Was that last year? Uh yeah, I think or, so. It might have even been this year, I'm not sure, you know. Yeah. I think it yeah, was last but, year. Within 12 months, or maybe 18 months, Porky, Richard Lattes fought Dubois and, and Fabio Wardley. Yeah. That shows you how little investment there was in Dubois. Dubois and Wardley are not the same level of talent. So, yeah. you know I mean? Frank's got this badly wrong. All of them have got this badly wrong. And it just makes me wonder, what have they been telling BT? And they've been telling BT it costs... 50 grand to get Lati over and they're paying Lati 20 grand and then somehow the money goes missing. I don't know. But we need to start asking questions about what was the plan because it all fell apart yesterday and I don't think, I don't know if Daniel can be the fighter we thought he was going to be. Yeah. I don't know. Well, there's a rumour going, there's a rumour doing the rounds that, uh, that, uh, two seconds. Oh, She's gone. There's a rumor doing Ruby. <laughs> there's a rumor doing rounds that uh, Frank was absolutely raging, raging, right last night, raging. So somebody's got it wrong, but this is how I look at well, it. Well, okay, can I ask a question, Frank, Russ? It starts with Frank, doesn't it? Yeah. What do you mean, Frank's raging? Um, you gave Dubois fifteen opponents. That, that that the fans were concerned about, where the fans were like, these aren't benchmark fights. The Gorman fight was. We understood why that needed to happen, but then you needed to move through the gears at that point. There needed to be a Brian Jennings in there, and there wasn't. So, Frank, you tell us why this wasn't the case. Now, Frank's saying that the management said no. We need to know why. Now, I know that certain things have happened on the journey which have forced them to to cool their interest, which is why I was surprised it took the Joyce fight. Yeah. So my, my theory at the moment is BT have said to Frank, you need to produce this year because COVID's messed things up. We can't, we can't keep talking about development. We need fights that are going to get the fans' attention, which is why there's been a real push to make this fight happen, is why you're seeing Yard against Lyndon Arthur happen, because Frank's got no choice. I don't think he wants to spend the money to get the big names from abroad over. So he's just going to play around with the stable. And this cost him now because he knows. And the reason Frank is raging, Joyce is off to match room. Yeah, he's going to match room to fight Usyk. And Joshua's going to free the belt up. And that's the word doing the rounds. 
It get, Eddie keeps the belt in house, then doesn't he? The WBO one. Yeah. Yeah. And takes and, on takes the WBO, which is basically Frank's organization that he's been using for years, hasn't he? Frank Frank has played this so badly. He he's becoming irrelevant in the UK because Aram has better UK fighters than he does. He's becoming irrelevant to that governing body he used to go to because he can't deliver the names anymore. Because Hearn just steals them off him. And what Hearn is doing is stealing them and parking them up, isn't he? Well, of course, because if I'm Hearn and I'm like, well, you are on the other side, you've got to suffer for a few years because I mean, you're not really Team Hearn yet. You haven't shown me that you're Team Hearn. Whereas with Joyce, I think Joyce, Joyce has never really... He hasn't been Team anyone. He's always been Team Joyce. So I think with Hearn, he'll work better with Joe, if you see what I mean, because Joe's never been a Frank Warren guy. Yeah. Do you feel, Terry, that uh, now we're seeing Eddie Hearn put the squeeze on Frank? Now, he do not want to work with him, does he? He said he didn't want to give him a leg up. He, he's, he's, he's said things to fans here and there and that, but they're not working together. They've put three fights on in 10 years, right? So he's not working with him. And it, I can explain it now. They just seem to be going nowhere. It's like a ship sinking fast. Tyson Fury, right? He's not got control of him, but he's parked up now by Heyman. His number two guy is has just lost last night and he knocked out. And not knocked out. Well, you know, he's, he quit, didn't he? So they don't know what's going to happen. Is he going to fight again? Yardy is number three guy. Anthony Yardy, he got knocked out. He's on way back, but... He, he's not the finished article, is he? And who's his number four guy? Liam Williams? I guess so, yeah. Uh, anything could happen with Liam Williams. We, 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 where's he heading now? Is this the end of Frank, or is he, is he going to be on the comeback trail again, or what, so, what could happen? So let's go back 30 or 40 years, right? In the old days, you had two wrestling organisations. You had the NWA, and you had the WWF. And the NWA was always known for being really about wrestling. Hey, what's that? It was like the National Wrestling Alliance. And so... I thought that, that was uh, easy, oh, the rappers. Easy <laughs> and all them lot. No, no. So, so, you had the, so you had the NWA, and you had these guys like Ric Flair and Sting and so forth. And these Good were the angle. guys... Good angle. No, 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 no. He, was, he came later. So you had guys like Ric Flair... Sting, um, the Wyndham brothers, Arn Anderson, and it was always about wrestling, and that's what they took pride in. You know, we don't do entertainment, we do wrestling, we make it real. And then you had the WWE, which is all about superstars and big events and celebrities. And we've got a similar thing with Frank and Eddie. Eddie's just about the big events, the memorable moments, the the superstars. That's all Hearn's really interested in. Whereas Frank you, you know, we've always said Frank's about grassroots guys building them up, building them properly. And so people are realizing you go to Frank for a few years to build and then you just go over to Eddie to to capitalize. And I think Frank is in danger of becoming a stepping stone to match room if he's not careful. He's like a Southampton FC, isn't he? Yeah. Sending players up to Liverpool and other clubs, isn't he? Man U and them. Arsenal. Exactly. And, and that's what Frank is now because... You're not excited by a stable. I could happily not watch any Frank fights. And I've got friends who are trainers and they train some of Warren's stable. And I'm honest with them. And I say, I'm not excited by these guys. The one guy he's got who I think has a future is Dennis McCann. But are you going to spend the money to get Dennis McCann the development fights that he needs? I he's don't know. Next big superstar from England in small weight division is Dennis McCann, isn't he? He, he looks the part, right? <laughs> but he's still got to develop that he's in that crucial phase where you do most of your professional learning between 17 and about 23. Yeah. That's when you do most of your like learning your style and all of that comes together in those years. If he doesn't get it right, then they've wasted that too. And I think Frank's blowing a lot of potential at the moment. And I don't know if it's because he's got so many people that he's not focused or maybe he's just losing his touch. I have no idea, but what we, what we're getting from Frank under that BT contract, isn't where it needs to be. Yeah. Do you think that, uh, you know, obviously we followed boxing all our lives, haven't we? But do, do you think that 
You know, years ago, you'd look at people like Carl Zaggy, Billy Joe Saunders, and Nathan Cle For example, Nathan Cleverly and Billy Joe, they went through all the levels, won all the belts, didn't they? Right? People, uh, uh, other people have won world titles with Frank, Ricky Burns, he were winning belts. And do you feel that he don't bring them on like he used to? Or do you feel that there's a slight little bit of panic and they're a bit rushed now? Whereas the old Frank Warren, he'd take his time with him and nurture them and let them marinate, wouldn't he? Do you okay, think so, let's, let's, no, so let's ask the real question. Who's Calzaghi's best win? Uh, Jeff Lacey, Mickey O'Kessler. Okay, but they're, they're not two guys. Look, one of them is best known for being St. Petersburg's finest boxer, St. Petersburg, Florida's finest boxer, and Jeff Lacey. And Mikhail Kessler's Den Denmark's maybe second best boxer. I don't know, maybe what best. No, Robin, yeah. Reed. Robin Reed. But yeah, but that's not the that wasn't the Robin Reed, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Frank didn't really do much for Calzaghi. Calzaghi's had this this mythical reputation based on the internet. Do you see what I mean? Like his highlight reels, are big. that's why people love him. It's not really based on his career because during his career, people kept saying he hasn't fought anyone. And remember, when he did fight those two big names, Jones and Hopkins, they both dropped him. Yeah, and they were 40-odd. Exactly. So, so he didn't do much for Calzaghi in terms of, you know, something we can really hang our hat on. So we look at Nathan Cleverly. Who's Cleverly's best win? We don't even know. Yeah. Ricky Burns had his best fights after he left Frank. Yeah, I suppose. You might be right there, Teddy. It's maybe mythical, isn't it? But maybe they want the guys for them to beat at the time. Well, a lot no, of we can't use the no, They were there. They were there. Well, didn't Cal they Hopkins fight with Cleverly, didn't they, at one point? Hmm? He made, he made the Hopkins fight, didn't he, with Cleverly at one point? Well, it didn't happen, did it? No, it didn't happen, but they did. They, they, were, they were trying, weren't they? He just couldn't seem to go in front of that line, could he? Didn't he make a fight with Wilder as well and Derek Chisora at one point as well? Uh, well, if Eddie Hearn told you that, you wouldn't believe him, would you? No. There you go. He did make, he did make a fight with Derek and Chisora, though, didn't he? Do you remember? I listen until until a, like you say, Porky. Until a fight's signed, I mean, or in some cases, until you see the guy in the ring, I don't believe that uh, talks are talks. I mean, talks happen all the time. I think the point with Frank is now we've got to start interrogating Frank and go, what's the game here with Frank Warren? Yeah, yeah. Number one, where are you getting your money from to do all these shows that must be loss making? Where are you getting that money from? Maybe. And why aren't BT asking questions? They might be asking questions and we just don't know about it. Because if I'm, if I'm looking at that, yeah, imagine, imagine you run BT, Porky, yeah. and you've texted your mates on, the, on, on like the FTSE 100 WhatsApp group that all you CEOs are part of, and you've said, listen, we've got this kid, Daniel Dubois, he's going to be the next best thing. He could probably beat Joshua now, yada, 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 yada. And you see him on his knee tapping out. And then you, you're there going, why am I even wasting my time with the sport? That's what I'd be doing. If I ran BT now, I'm ringing the zone and saying, do you want this, do you want this mess? Because I don't want it. Because there's, there's, there's going to be ramifications tomorrow when he gets to his office. And it's like I said in my video earlier today, Ed's are going to, first you're angry, then you're upset, then they're going to play a blame game, aren't they? And Frank's going to, he's either missed the ball completely or he's been blagging it. It's one of them, isn't it? Yeah, because I don't want to hear like, people talk about, oh, he was unlucky with the eye injury, admittedly. But he didn't look ready for that level of fight. That's what worries me. He didn't look ready. Joe did. Joe did everything right. Joe just said, if I can disrupt the Dubois jab, I disrupt Dubois's whole strategy. That's what he did. Yeah. I don't understand why the corner didn't say. When that eye started swelling up, I'd have said to Daniel, listen, if you don't keep that left hand up, you're going to jeopardize your career. Forget this fight for a second. You're going to jeopardize your career. Keep that left hand up. I don't care if you have to go southpaw. I don't care what you have to do now. You need to keep his fist away from your eye. That is your objective. And once you do that, we'll work out how we're going to attack him from there. Did because you that shows you care. 
Yeah, did you hear uh, Jimmy Tibbs in between rounds to Joyce saying, you're beating him with a jab, son. You're beating him with just a jab. <laughs> but he was right. He, that's, ex that's exactly what Never the... Never any big writers, did he, Joe? Did he, hardly? Didn't, didn't need to. So I, I'm, I'm reasonably close to the guy that was in Joe's corner, Steve. I've known Steve for about five years now. And he was, he was supremely confident. From the start, he said, no, no, no. Because he asked a question that most fans didn't. When have you seen Dubois show his skills at the top level? You haven't really. Oh. But you have with Joe. Joe beat Brian Jennings with an under-par performance. And Jennings isn't an easy guy to, to run over. He's not easy. Beats Tavern as well, didn't he? Former WBC champion. Yeah, Joe, my mate, my mate Daniel Parker, he was the only guy I know who, who, who thought we were all crazy. He was like, he, and he said it from the start. He said, I've seen nothing in Dubois that impresses me. And Dan and Joe had sparred for four years solid between Joe starting boxing and him going off to GB. They sparred solidly because they were at the same boxing club. And he was the guy who said to me, Joe might have one of the best chins in boxing, which I found hard to believe. But then when you look at Joe physically, he's one of the few heavyweights that I don't believe even needs drugs. He's just naturally freakishly big. He looks like one of them farm boys that we used to live near, near me and they just throw throw like big A stacks around on a big fork on their own and they didn't they didn't look like Rambo or all like that. But they, you, you know, when you, when you played rugby against them, it was like 12, 13 year olds. They were overpowering everybody, but they didn't look much and they weren't really sporty. You know that type? That's what he is. He's just one of those guys who genetics and mechanics have just blessed him with with strength yeah. and solidity. And so we've we've got to congratulate Joe. Above all else, we've all got to say, listen, he he endured the disrespect from the public. He endured disrespect from boxing fans, disrespect from Dubois about his mum. He he swallowed all of this and he let his boxing do the talking. Yeah, yeah, I suppose, yeah. We have to tip us out to him. Uh, he took some li big licks off uh, Debar, and people who were Debar hates, they usually fall like trees, don't they? And he, and he just, he was eating them up like Pac-Man, wasn't it? And that's got to be scary for people like Joshua, do you think? Well, those two know each other. So uh, psychologically, they they already, they know each other. So I don't think much is going to change. They've done round after round together. Mm -hmm. You know, that's another thing people forget. Joe Joyce is the reason why Fraser Clark has never been to the Olympics. Yeah. Like, imagine you spent a decade in that GB setup and you've had to watch Joshua and Joyce go ahead of you. Yeah, and you're still there now. Well, I don't, it doesn't look like he's going to go to the Olympics. He might turn over. Yeah, he might though, because he's gonna. If he goes to Olympics, it'll be next year. He'll be thirty then, won't he? I think so. Yeah. So time's knocking on for young Fraser, isn't it? Because he's not young Fraser now. The prospect is he? Yeah, and and the thing is, there's no learning. Like, there's no headroom for him to learn. He's going to be the boxer that he is. So he may as well just crack on with it. Not much is going to be different now. Yeah, yeah. He could get injured, couldn't he? Oh, could happen. Yeah. Couldn't it? Uh, all right then. Uh, looking at it from outside, do you think that the matchmaking's to uh, to blame because we've got Spencer Fearon coming out saying a lot of people were gassing uh, young young Debar up, and but I, I think the matchmaking's got a bit to blame. And Frank's obviously signed off on it. On when any fights are made by a matchmaker or a team, when they sit down and say, "Right, what we're going to do?" You bring what will happen is you'll have a list up, a five to five to ten fighters, and you'll go through them all. Now, whoever is picked, or whoever they, they choose to pick the guy, the main guy in the outfit signs off on it. So Frank must have signed off on the Joyce fight, but has he been told of people high above? Look, we're going to have to do something here because. You behind we're behind Eddie and what he's doing. You think him chasing Eddie Earn and trying to create another star? Do you think it's backfired? <laughs> okay, so so Russ, if you come to me, yeah, as head of boxing, yeah, 
and you say to me, listen, Terry, my promoter needs a guy who can win a British title in two years and can win a European title in three and a half years, right? I will tell you, here the guys we're going to have to fight to get there. This is how much it's going to cost. Yeah. You need to sign off on this budget. Yeah. If you don't sign off on it, I can't deliver that for you. So yeah. my question back to the boxing universe is, is it that BT said you need to turn this guy into a world champion in three years or four, well, I'll say four years. And Frank said, it's going to cost you half a million quid. And they said, nah, do it for half of that. And so he had to cut corners. Or is it that Frank has been maybe, you know, pocketing some of that for himself or using some of that Dubois budget to cross subsidize other projects he's got on the go? I don't know. These are only questions that I don't, I'm surprised that the boxing world's not asking Frank these questions. Well, some, some of it's gone fundamentally wrong on it for Frank at the moment. And I see, I, I don't see good coming out of this because that kid is not going to fight now for about a year, is he really? With an injury like that, nerve damage is quite bad, isn't it? To back up the eye, in it, he's got nerve damage and he's got orbital bone problems, and he in his eye socket. So he, he's not going to fight till next year, is he? Well, into next year, so they're saying. Yeah. I, I it, look, the Kel Brook thing's taught us take a year and a half off. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, take a year and a half off. He'll come back when he's 25 now, that kid, right? So he comes back, he might put weight on, he might get disinterested. He's actually got a few quid out of the job so far, so he's all right, isn't he? But he's from a fighting family, isn't he? And I, t I kind of like feel for the kid, to be honest, because I think he's been rushed, but. It, hindsight's a great thing. We were all saying it were a great fight and that because we were all led to believe the hype. But when he got in the ring, there were still things missing from his game that we found that Joe Joyce found out for us. So it's all right. Well, Go on, sorry. Okay, but let's pause for a second. Let's be objective here. That was a close fight. Yeah, it now, was, yeah. 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 Like, I, I don't, it, for me, when people said, how do you see this? I said, this fight will finish 115, 113 to someone. Yeah, that's close. Yeah, Do, it's not like Dubois was ever out of the fight. I think what we were disappointed in was he didn't blitz Joe. Yeah, he, he was always in that fight, but that's a very hard fight for a twenty-three-year-old to take. You know I mean because you're remember this? You're you're dipping into your overdraft too early in your career. Yeah, fight number sixteen, and you're having to dig into your overdraft. It's it's dangerous. Mileage on clock in his 16th fight, Terry. It's unheard of, isn't it? Exactly. But Joe will do that to you. I think people will see Joe Joyce do that now and they'll give him a wide berth. You won't hear Diddy and call out Joe Joyce. I'm bigging him up in it today. Because <laughs> he's trying to avoid him, that's why. Yeah. Well, we know that. We know we know he didn't want to fight any Joe Joyce. He's an avoided guy, isn't he? Joyce, 12 and 0, 11 by knockouts. Olympic silver should have been gold, so some people say. And he, he's beat former world champions, British Commonwealth European. He's what is he, number two ranked? He, he's, he's ticked every box, hasn't he? He doesn't put a foot wrong. He doesn't, he doesn't party pop. He doesn't get drunk and carry off, does he? he why has nobody really got behind him? He's, he, he were actually the B side. I mean, are, are people actually missing something here with this lad? He hasn't got the machine behind him. Yeah. When you don't have the... the, the here's what boxing fans don't realise. Old boxing fans think that they come to their decisions through their own thoughts and through logic and this, that and the other. They don't. Oh, IFL. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're being subtly programmed to believe certain things, right? Yeah. Sometimes you've just got to stop and go back to the basics of boxing. Who's got the better pedigree? Who's got the better CV? Who's got the better skills? Don't talk about anything else. Yeah, it's uh, like I said, he, he's uh, and, he, and, if, and we're talking about a guy here as big as Joe is six foot six, 18 and a half stone, throwing you know 120 punches around and still doing it in 12th round if he needs to. You know, you know, you they've got a machine here, aren't you? That ain't got a machine behind him, if you know what I mean. Yeah. How, how have people like Mick Hennessy? People like that and other people, McGuigan's. How have they missed out on this guy? And he ended up with Richard Schaefer, David A, 
he's, he's passed, been passed about, hasn't he? And I, I don't get yeah. it. You know. Yeah, so, so I, I was reasonably close to the story. So what happened was they looked at it. So Matchroom, as they always do, looked and they just went, look, Joyce is, is 31. I think he was 31 at the time. He hasn't really lit up the World Boxing Super Series. Um, Olympic silver medal. But, but hey, Schaefer and the whole Ring Star operation that had their eye on that 2016 intake. And their whole thing was, we're going to sign Joe and we're going to sign Tony Yoka and we're going to build them. And eventually these guys are going to fight on a pay-per-view platform and that's how we'll cash out. That was the original plan. Yeah. The problem was it was hard to get the the development fights because no one wanted to see Ringstar succeed as a promotional company. Yeah. And so if you notice, Ringstar's kind of gone and it's more of a management platform now. But the original plan was to sign up a lot of these like moneyball, a lot of these guys that people weren't willing to put money behind, get them, train them properly. So that's why Ishmael Salas was important. And Joe was part of that. So when that fell apart, Joe was in the wilderness. And so people then looked at his age. And by then he was like 32 or whatever. And they're like, no, nah, I'm not sure about this guy. 35 so, now, isn't he? Yeah. Had, had he been 10 years younger, Heard would have signed him up in a heartbeat. Yeah, it's a shame. Uh, all right, then. Moving on. What what about the judging? What do you think to that? <sighs> Should your scorecard, sorry, if it had gone to points, could you see, could you have seen uh, any score doggery? Uh, didn't one have it eight rounds to do? But one had it two rounds to Joyce, and one had it level or something. It was, it was something like that. I heard but it looked like we could like or split win for Dubois. It was it was looking like that's where it was headed. Uh Frank, we're talking rematches, one of you at weighing. Oh, God, no. God, no. Joyce is the guy you're one and done. Like, no, you're one... about the weigh-in. You know what, the weigh-in, yes, on Friday. He was yeah. to Bunce, there could be, a, could be a rematch. Will there be a rematch? Frank was saying, well, we love rematches. But, no. And you were talking rematch on IFL last night, but I don't... Who would no. want to see a rematch with that? No, they won't, would they? No, to me, no. It's no. Good job, isn't it? Nah, it's one and done. I think Dubois has got a year and a half to get his act together, and in that time, my advice to him is: I'd be reading that contract and looking for a way out. That's what I'd be doing. I'd That's be looking. At that. deal, didn't they? Yeah, I'd be looking to get out of that. I'd definitely be getting rid of my management contract. I'd be changing my trainer, and I would be going as soon as the eye heals up. I'd be going to gyms and training with other people. I'd just be doing a boxing education. And I'd find out once and for all, is this something I really want to do? Yeah. Do you feel that the bar's team will come down heavy on Martin Bowers' his trainer? Well, Martin Bowers is his manager as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's going to be very difficult because they've got contracts, haven't they? I, if, if I was honest and if I was Martin Bowers, I'd admit I'm out of my depth at this level. I think he is out of his depth. And I'd say... I can't take Joe to a world title. And so I'd either relinquish management duties or I'd relinquish training duties. I'd dearly no. just relinquish both. You said Joe, do you mean Daniel, sorry? Uh, Daniel, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I just yeah. think Bowers is out of his depth. I think all of those Peacock guys have been shown to be out of their depth. Anything beyond British level, they always look like they only learned about boxing yesterday. You think? Yeah. Because you can't show me a success story out of that gym. Dylan White trained there, didn't he? No, he trained at Miguel's, didn't he? Yeah, but his greatest success came when he went off to Loughborough. Yeah. So I'm so, so my challenge to anyone in the comments, name me five people that the Peacock have taken beyond British level. Gary Kikoran. What did he win? He, he, he fought for a world title, didn't he, Gary Kikoran, didn't he? Against who? Uh, forget now, but uh, he was with Peacock. He, he, uh, he, who did he fight now? I ta two seconds, let me just have a little look on my phone. <laughs> he, uh, Gary Kokoran fought for a world title recent last year, I think. 
Uh, Ewa, Ewa from Peacock. Uh, I don't. I can't name another one. Yeah, but do you see what I mean? Like this, this whole East London, this East End boxing thing, it's been a myth for a long time. This whole Essex, South East, it's all been a bit of a myth. And all these trainers are a bit of a myth because they never get beyond world level. Well, it's, uh, I think it's sad that the trainer gets, because if Martin Bowers were swearing at him in between rounds, but if he'd have pulled it out of the bag and stopped Joyce or hung in there another two rounds and won on points, he'd be an hero, Martin, wouldn't he? And there's a fine no. line. No, Russ, Russ, because I was saying this before, and I've said it in the context of other boxers, where I asked the question, what have you learned in the last two years? What have you learned? Like, for me, a good trainer is a good educator. Like, you, your fighters should know more about the sport after two years of being with you than they did before. But what a lot of trainers do, Russ, is they try and keep the knowledge from you so you become dependent on them. It's like the music industry. You ever notice in the music industry, Russell, that you, you, have, you have all these people who are famous, but they always leave the industry with no money. So they always have to go back and beg the industry for an opportunity. So then you've got to get on your knees and you've got to, you've got to suck something. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. It was Jeff keep... Horn, his name, that guy, Jeff Horn. As, there you go. I can't even take that seriously. That, that's, that's, that's Jeff Horn, who's an undeserving champion. W fighting Bell's someone. Who... Yeah, they have to find someone who is worse than him. Because remember, he stole the belt off Pacquiao. And then they were like, well, we can't put him in with anyone decent because we won't keep the belt. So we need someone to hold the belt till we can get the Crawford fight set up. So they gave it to that Corcoran. Frank just fed him to Jeff Horn. Yeah, he did way with Frank Peacock, though, wasn't he? Excuse me. But was he, he wasn't even mandatory, was he? He was just, uh, we've just plucked this guy from nowhere. Voluntary. Yeah. So I can't take that seriously because, mate, Russ... You know, if, if I rank certain people, I'll get you ranked 15 in the IBF and then we can have a voluntary against whoever. You just go have a dinner, don't you, with him lobby? <laughs> yeah, you know, some nice restaurants in Leeds. Mm. So what, what do you think that what you, you were saying about this myth, myth and myth? It's that... all a myth. All these trainers, oh, mate, we train out of this gym and that gym in Canning Town and we do this. It's all a myth. It's all a myth, and it upsets me because I've got friends in these gyms, and I know that their careers are screwed because they're not learning anything. They're just doing. And the reason they're doing is that if you take someone's knowledge and go elsewhere, the trainer normally feels stupid, so they keep you dependent on them. Yeah, come to this gym. Work with our trainers. Do all of this. Do all of that. So you're, you're scared to leave. Do you think it's, that's it's, why Spencer Feeling were a bit harsh on Martin Bowers in that interview this morning? Well, Spencer shouldn't be because Spencer's tried the same game himself. But the thing with Spencer was he couldn't hack it. And boxing moved beyond Spencer Fearon. They were all gassing him up and things like that. And... So was Spencer Fearon, man. Oh, oh, Dubois' dad's my best friend. Daniel's like a godson to me. He's my brother. Oh, oh. So was Spencer Fearon, for God's sake. He was on. He was on the. He was on the nuts train. He was nuts chewing train. on those nuts. <laughs> but he he chews on everyone's nuts. He's on yards. He's on everyone's nuts. He nuts. He... Doctor Dre song that I. <laughs> the chronic. These nuts. <laughs> and, and look, and, and as a man, I like Spencer. I'm. I'm. I'll name my colors with must. I like Spencer as a man. But boxing is the second industry outside the music industry for men behaving like bitches and whores yeah. because they need that drug that is access. Everyone wants access in boxing. And I never understand why I don't want access. I've had it. I hated it. It's a dirty industry. I don't want access. Screw that. You know, I don't, but these guys are Spencer. They want it. They want to feel important. So they prostitute themselves when the time is right. Do you think that's what's wrong with boxing at the moment? There's too many prostitutes. Yeah. But, you know, Russ, I used to have a... I used to date a lady, and she was American. And she's, she's like, big in music PR now. Yeah. 
and she'd tell me stories about what happens. Um, and I'm going to say allegedly for this one, right? And just to illustrate how messed up the world is. Allegedly, there's an artist called Little Bow Wow. And they invited him to a party. And they drugged him. And when he was drugged, a few men ran a train on him. You know what that is. You've been inside. They ran a train on him and they videoed it. And you know what they did to him? Allegedly, they said, my friend, you're going to sign this contract. And it was a horrible recording contract where he got virtually nothing and he got no control. And basically, it was a slave contract. And they said, you're going to sign this. And he was like, no, I'm not. They showed him the video and they said, do you want this to get out? He signed that contract. They're the allegations. And boxing's got its own way of doing that too. And that's how everyone looks out for each other. So when they need someone, they just wheel them out because they've got the evidence and they've got the blackmail on you. So they'll go, look, Person X, go and write an article in The Independent saying this. We need you to say that. Or trainer X, I need you to train this guy for me. Even though you don't like him, I need you to train him for me. Do you want to do me a favor? That means that you keep your marriage. Yeah. It's a dirty, dirty game. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it, could, it could be serious repercussions though for, for BT this unboxing at the moment because if they pull out what 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 what's where does that leave Frankie because is Box Nation still going? So so for BT this is good, right? Because everyone's gonna go back and watch that fight or you're gonna go in the BT highlights. For BT this is good. It pushes them to the top of the of the news ladder in boxing. So it's good for them in the short term. Terrible in the long term because their golden goose is done. If I'm if I'm if I'm James Rushton at the zone right now, I'm ringing BT and saying we will buy your boxing assets off you, your UK assets. We will buy them and we'll go head to head with Sky in the UK and we might partner abroad. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, and and Dubois, he'll feel like he's being passed from pillar to post now, won't he? He'll have everybody in his ear. He'll not know who to trust and all that and what to do now, will he? They'll try and separate him from his dad. Always the case, right? When you get defeated, it's like, well, I think your old man's getting in the way here. I think that's the main problem. They'll always try and separate the kid from his dad. And that'll be the sad part of it because his dad was the reason Dubois ended up where he was. And his dad's a good man. His dad's not an idiot. And his dad knows that he was being shortchanged at Peacock. Now let's see who's got the balls to make the change. Yeah, there's going to be some big changes, and I, I, I were hoping it was going to be a success actually, because I quite like uh, Martin, his trainer, and I've never met his dad, but I like I like that peacock. You know, I've been there. I, I okay, was... so I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you a question. Bearing in mind it's a boxing gym, why do you like Martin Bowers? Because when I went there, he checked me all right, and that he checked me. All okay, right. but 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 from a boxing perspective, what did he do for you that impressed you? Uh. Well, they arranged for me to park my car and that, and then he let me, he sorted me out all, loads of free stuff and that, and we had a cuppa and a chat, and yeah. he introduced me to a few people, and that I spent a bit of time there, and I thought he was all right, he was a gentleman, and I thought, oh, he's a nice guy, because you, you, you meet some people in game that are not that nice, don't you? And I thought, oh, he's all right, I'm going to follow them. So here, here's, the, here's the problem with boxing. What you've just said there's a problem with boxing. We let what we feel about someone obscure the fact that we don't know whether they can do their job or not. Well, I didn't see him taking anybody up pads or anything like that, but I just thought he was a gentleman and that. Yeah, but but we see these things get in the media, right? And and we hear Adam Smith say it a lot. Like he'll say this about people, like, yeah, the very knowledgeable Jamie Moore. And then you stop and you go, okay, what well, what does that actually mean, Adam Smith? The knowledgeable Jamie Moore. What does that mean? Like, who is he taking over the line? And only when boxing fans start asking real questions and they start judging people in boxing by the job that they do. It's like you, Russ. I'm not going to judge you as a trainer, mm. right? I want to be like, what's Porky like for his boxing content? Because that's what your lane is in boxing, right? Yeah. What I think about you as a person, that's between you and me as men. Publicly, yeah. if someone says to me, do you like Porky's channel? I'm like, I quite enjoy what Russ does. He has an important part to play. I don't say that because you're my mate. I say that because 
if you didn't exist, I'd want someone like you to exist anyway. And so that's my view on what you do. Yeah. And so when you say Martin Bowles is a good guy, I don't dispute that. I think he's probably a thoroughly good man. Do I think he could take someone to a world title and they could win it and hold it and defend it? Nah, I don't. Because there's always, no evidence of it. I always side, though, with because obviously Martin got a big sentence, didn't he, for armed robbery? And people like Martin and Peter Fury, he got a big sentence for being a drug dealer. And and obviously Jimmy Tibbs got that sentence for letting for all, all that trouble they had in the 70s. I always tend to side with people like that, you know, like the underdog people who've, had, no, who've, had, who've been through adversity. I always tend to side with them sort of people who've done... Wait, wait, like, wait, wait, wait. What, what adversity? No one asked No one asked him to rob the bank. Yeah, I know that, but I'm just saying though. But they, they got caught and they got done for it, convicted, and they done the time like men and got out, and then they're, they're, they're involved in boxing now, and it's sort of like puts you on right track a little bit, like myself. So I always tend to side with people that have seen adversity in their lives. Whereas Eddie Earn, he he's done a book called Relentless, but he's never really had any adversity to overcome, has he? Wait, wait. So no, no I don't think that's fair. So. Oh. You're, you're punishing Hearn for, for flying straight. No, I'm not punishing punish him for flying straight, but when I'm seeing him coming out saying he's relentless and this and that, yeah. well, he's had everything. He is. Well, no, no, he is. He is. He drives a Rolls Royce Wraith of money that he's generated. Yeah. He took his dad's operation and he made it 10 times bigger. We yeah. can't dispute that. No, we can't. But like I said, they've never, he's never had to go through anything that's... Like, like everyday people, has he? he's never had a blip in his life, has he? Only blip he had when Carl okay. Patterson left him. That was his first ever blip. So, Russ, here's my perspective on this, well, yeah. right? Whenever I hear about this guy went to jail and this guy is this, I just think those guys are fucking dickheads, to be honest with you. That's my view. Because I grew up and my uncles were child soldiers in a war of independence, right? And they went through stuff that's scary to talk about now. My... My grandparents were nearly killed in one of the worst genocides in Southern Africa. Do you know what I mean? My grandparents literally left their house and just walked for like 100 kilometers in just the clothes on their back to get away from being killed. That's adversity. That's when you have to be relentless. You wake up one day and decide to rob a bank and you go to jail for it. I don't give a fuck. Never have done. I don't respect people that go to jail. I don't hate them. I just say, that's what you sign up for. Is that because you're no. a banker? <laughs> no, 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 Russ, it's not because because I've been nicked and I've been through all of that. And I'm not I'm not proud of it. But and I remember what my dad said at the time. You that's what you sign up for. If you if you rob a bank and you go inside and you start crying because you can't handle jail, I can't feel sorry for you. The bare minimum you've got to do if you sell drugs or you rob a bank is you've got to ride that bird. Because if you stash the money away, let's say you do a quarter mil and you get five years, that's 50 grand a year. That's how you got to work out in your head. Yeah. Someone's oh, I've just earned 50 grand a year. Worth it. So I don't that's think that's adversity. You can that out here, can't you, and not be in jail? Yeah. For me, adversity is that adversity is that mum that's got four kids and the kid's father died or something in Afghanistan and she's now got to work out how to raise the kids. That's adversity. Because you're greedy and you want to rob a bank so you can be rich and drive this and drive that, I have no sympathy for you. But I understand that people do it. But just understand that, yo, there's heaven and there's hell. So for me, I put, I put them all in the same bracket. You know, I think a lot of criminals behave like spoiled children. I think a lot of rich kids behave like spoiled children. Yeah. You know? All right, then. Uh, so, basically, do you think that BT will stay in boxing? It does nothing for them, right? It does nothing for them. So, we could be seeing a big change, then, in the next 12 months with, with boxing, then, in this country, a massive one. I don't know what the contract is with Frank, but I, I, I've said, I think you and I talked about this, and it was, uh, no, I know it wasn't on the, an episode, but I've said to you before, I just think those assets are for sale. I think if BT could get the right offer for those assets, they'd sell. It's a headache they don't need. All right, then. Uh, moving on, then. Last night's boxing, uh, Danny Jacobs and 
Gabe Rosado were a split decision. Do you think Billy Joe, if he fights Martin Murray this week, if the, if the fight goes ahead on Friday and he beats Martin Murray, do you think Eddie will put him in with Jacobs? <laughs> I know, I know I've just talked up Eddie Hearn. Now I've got a, now I've got a, and now I've got to kick him in the face. There was a time when Jacobs was hot and he was a hell of a fighter and we knew we knew where he's we were, we knew where we stood with him, and so him fighting Billy Joe back then made sense. He's gone backwards a lot, and I, look, I like Gabe Rosado. He's a friend of a friend. I, I like what he is. He's old school. He'll fight anyone anywhere. But Gabe's seen better days. He gave us an absolute stinker with Martin Murray, so he's not really the blood and guts guy that Hearn tried to sell him as. So you put Billy Joe in with Gabe, you might get a good builder, but the fight will be terrible. You put Billy Joe with Danny Jacobs, I think Billy just boxes rings around him, to be honest with you. Yeah. And I don't want to see, I don't even want to see that. But I'd rather see the Ryder rematch. If Billy gets through Martin Murray, just give him the Ryder rematch. And then whatever Callum Smith does, win, lose, or draw, put him in with Callum Smith. Let's just get, let's get all this stuff done before these guys are too old to make it happen. I mean, yep. Eddie's got a lot of super middleweights in country, but they don't seem to be fighting each other, do they? Remember we talked about this before, Paul, yeah. where I said, Hearn's waiting to get a better deal with Sky before he puts the big fights on. We're going to get this nonsense until you hear that the contract's been agreed. Then you'll get your good fights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's playing end game, isn't he? Well, he just wants more money because... He's creating a lot of value in boxing at a time when no one else seems to be pushing it. He seems to be the one guy who's, who's actually being relentless. Think about what he's done, Russ. Yeah, he's done well. For himself. He's turned boxing into a soap opera. We know on Monday there'll be an IFL interview with Eddie Hearn. Yeah. And that will set the tone for that week in boxing. It's like when, Pork, it's like when Porky's Corner comes out. We wait for it because we're like, we need the update. Yeah. We need to know what happened to you know, what happened with Chris Smedley. We need to know what happened with Frank. We need to know what happened with Dennis. Because you've also done this where you've created this narrative that's consistent week after week. Yeah. Weapon of the week. <laughs> no, no, no. And, it's, you know, I don't like publicly tipping my hat to you, but you've done that, Russ. Like, there's a weekly story with you. And then there's obviously the other bits you pick up on. But it's like, okay, it's the same characters, and I love that. Because it gives me that that stability, and Hearn's done that, which I think is phenomenal, and that's what keeps people engaged in boxing. Now, half of what he says is nonsense, but it doesn't matter. Hearn's just trying to entertain; he's not trying to be factual, because no one in boxing is trying to be factual. Do you know if do you know if you had to pick a weapon at week? Obviously, I pick weapon at week, Terry. Uh, yeah. I thought it was voted for. No, the helmets is voted for. Ah. Uh, if you had to pick a weapon of the week, because I'm going to film it in the morning for the last seven days, who would you pick for the last seven days? Um, that judge that gave it eight rounds to Dubois. I've heard it were five, though. They've altered it to five. I've seen an interview, so I don't know. It needs checking, but... Would that be... still, still a weapon. Was that a British judge? Yeah, yeah, I think it was all Brits. Yeah, yeah, that's a weapon. Like, mate, you wrote your scorecard before the fight even started. Yeah, it's uh... all right then. Uh, moving on from Gabe Rosado and the whole episode with the super mm. middleweights. What about Mike Tyson, Roy Jones? Did you watch it? Do you know what I did, Pork, and I kind of enjoyed it. I think that might be my most enjoyable fight of the weekend, Russ. And I tell you why I enjoyed it. Because I'd watch it and I'd be like, God, they're old. And then Tyson would just do something and you're like, there's still bits of it in there. You know when you're watching Mike and you're like, there's still little bits of Mike in there. Well, it goes like that, that, it goes like that, doesn't it? And comes peekaboo and comes storming and moving his head. You know, it wasn't even that. It was when Roy Jones would try and escape side to side and Tyson had that scouted and he'd just throw a hook and you'd see that it hurt Roy. Like, a lot of those punches looked painful. It, it looked like a real fight. I, I know they're old guys, but it looked like a real fight. And I was there going, if you let Tyson just jump in with someone, maybe not like a Chisora because he's too big, but even like a Michael Hunter for three rounds, what could Mike do for three rounds? 
you just, you it had you wondering. And then I'm, then I started watching it, Russ, and I'm thinking this version of Roy Jones. If you dropped a bit of timber and you whacked him in with Hopkins, what would we see if they did it over two minute rounds like this? And then I'm thinking about what's James Tony got in the tank. It got me feeling nostalgic. And what I loved was the level of skill between those two men and the ring IQ those two men had. And you realize that not many people in British boxing or boxing in general have that level of IQ. Yeah, you know, you know, James Tony, people like that, your Mayweathers and all these top Americans over the last 30, 40 years. Who have we got that we could ha that could hang with them for ring IQ? Um, Clinton Woods. Hmm, Clinton. Oh, that's nice. Clinton will like that. Clinton, I know you're watching. He'll like that, Clinton. <laughs> uh, who else, though, besides Clinton Woods? Harold, Harold Graham, I'll give him his due. He 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 could he could create unusual problems. Prince Nassim Hamid could create unusual problems. I know one of your favourites was Ryan Rose. He had bits of that in him. Yeah, what about Tyson Fury? Ah, tricky with Tyson because he's so much bigger than everyone else, right? That it, he has that advantage. I'd love to have seen how good Tyson Fury would be if he was six foot five. Same skill set, same body type, make him six foot five. Yeah. And what happens? Yeah. Do you think Tyson could hang with any heavyweight in any era going back 100 years? Yeah, I think so. I do. Good, yeah. 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 He, he's, he has such a good boxing intellect. And you know it from the way he even speaks about the game. He, nah, he's, Tyson Fury's a special talent. Whether he's always demonstrated that in the ring, not really. But when he's needed to, he's been special. What do you see happening with Dylan White now, Terry? Okay, so here's my theory, right? You like this, Porky. I think the WBC are going to call a mandatory mm. in early next year. And I don't know who it will be. It might be Wilder. Usyk won't take it because Usyk is WBO mandatory. So he's like, I'll wait for this one. So they'll go down the list and they might end up at like a Luis Ortiz. So Fury might end up having to fight Luis Ortiz. And so that's so people will say, okay, what happens if Dillian beats Povetkin? The WBC will kick it down the road into 2022. But I just don't believe the WBC will allow Dillian to fight for that belt. My theory at the moment is a lot of what he says is distasteful. You know, you know like, I don't care who you are in boxing there's a certain level of honour and class that you kind of expect of your champions or the guys who are going to fight for the title. Yeah. And I don't think he demonstrates that. Like, sometimes you have to know how to be a diplomat and you've got to know how to play the game sometimes. And sometimes playing the game means you say nothing, you keep fighting the people put in front of you, you keep winning, and if you're quiet for long enough, the governing body will just say, okay, now's your turn. If you keep making noise and disrespecting them and shouting and disrespecting other fighters, they just, they just put you on the sidelines. You think that's what's happened with Dylan White? Yeah, of course. If <laughs> you're telling me Brazil, Brazil can fight Deontay Wilder, you're telling me Ortiz can fight him twice and Dylan can't get one fight. <laughs> Come on. That, that, that lets you know that you know, people are blocking him. Do you think that Dylan White's six pay per view in January is the way boxing is going at the moment because six pay per views and it's not fought for a European. Do you think we're seeing a change in how boxing's run now? Yeah, I think you'll have a pay per view a month in 2021, 2022. Yeah. You'll have one pay per view every month, and I don't mind that. Because boxing fans allowed this to happen, so fair enough. What I would like to see Sky do is at least say, we're going to have a pay-per-view pay every month, but anything that's not pay-per-view, there'll be no filler fights, there'll be no learning fights. If kids need learning fights, they're going to do it on the small hall scene. All you're going to get is, from Sky, you're going to get pay-per-views, that's your Joshua's, your Wilder's, 
and whoever. Off pay-per-view, you're going to get your Ted Cheesemans, your Scott Fitzgeralds, your Anthony Fowlers, your Okolis, your Boatsis, whoever. But they're all going to be meaningful fights. All those fights like you used to have in the days of prospects and journeymen, just happen on the small hall scene. Just wash your hands of them and, you know, have these kids have to prove themselves and earn the right to be on TV. Mm. So, you think that there'll be more pay-per-views next year in 2022 than ever before then? Yeah, because the model works. But I think all, look, they did it with Premier League football. You see, they, they, they tested it. Sky have been waiting to do pay-per-view football for about five years. And so they tried it this time and the fans were up in arms, right? Mm. But it's coming. Pay-per-view football is coming. Well, the boxers, <laughs> the boxing fans have not been up in arms for being served up rubbish, have they? But yeah, boxing fans don't care because no one watches it to get entertained anymore. You watch it so you can bitch about it on Twitter. That's what you do. So it's, it's, always, it's always worth the 20 quid. So, I mean, for the extra followers you get for moaning about it. Mm. Yeah, it's... Uh... What about uh... Shannon Courtney's fight? She's she's saying she's definitely going to fight Rachel Ball next year. Do you think that happens? Mm. I think it does, but I can see her fighting Beck Connolly for the Commonwealth title first. That's what I can see happening. And then she'll fight Rachel Ball. Hearn's going to drag this out. And I don't see why they do this with women's boxing, why they drag out the fights we want to see. Just give us more of what we want to see and we're more likely to accept it as a, as a viable addition to our sport. Because there's not enough talent for them to be giving us, you know, Shannon Courtney versus C-level opposition, if I'm being honest with you. I'd quite like to see meaningful fights happening. You know, whack Shannon Courtney in with Rachel Ball, whack her in with whoever. I mean, let, let those top five, top six women just box each other until the sport's mature enough. There's only two in Shannon Courtney's weight division in the UK. Yeah, send it to Mexico, send it to Africa. You can, there are bodies out there, man. There, there's a lady called Helen Joseph that can make 118. She'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel that it demeans belts when you've got women, women saying they're a world champion, but yet. If San and Courtney is world level, what does area level mean at women's level? I try not to compare women's boxing to men's boxing because they're in fundamentally different places in terms of maturity. Yeah. I, the, for me, the belts are irrelevant for now. Until you've got deep enough talent pool, the belts are irrelevant. It's more about the fights we get. So Shannon Courtney versus Rachel Ball was a good fight. Yeah. The, the, the knockdown made it more interesting because Shannon had to play catch up. I thought that was really good. Um, but then par paradoxically, I enjoyed watching that beat down that Ellie Scott he gave Beck Connolly, not because I don't like Beck, but it was nice to see a female boxer come out and try and take someone's head off. That was enjoyable to watch as well. We just need more of that, more of that variety, but keep the same level of entertainment. And I think we will we'll help women's boxing cross over. Yeah. Isn't Dennis doing a woman's fight on his show? Yeah, it's Frank Maloney, one of Frank Maloney's fighters. It's a girl, I forgot her name now. I thought you were going to say it was Frank Maloney. I was like, what? No, it's uh, is it Ellie, Go Ellie Gooley or something? Or some I don't know, I forgot her name. But, uh, but yeah, Frank, Frank uh, Kelly Maloney, sorry, back on the scene. Well, uh, Kelly and Dennis used to be partners, didn't they, 20 years ago? Yeah, and they did a, lot, they did a hell of a lot of good work, man. Maybe a, lot of friends, a lot of friends went through that system, as you know, David, Small Z. David Pereira, loads of them. Yeah, they all went through that. That, that uh, round about that time, BBC were red hot, weren't it, for boxing? And... Mate, do you know that? So that was my when people say, "How do you know so much about boxing?" Round about that time, Frank used to be in Fitzroy Lodge on a weekly basis. He'd come down and have a cup of tea with Mick Carney, and they'd just be talking. So I could just sit and listen, and that's how I learned so much about the game. You just sit and you listen, and you're yeah. like, oh, okay, and like. Frank would come in, he'd just have a look. And see, promoters and managers don't do this anymore. Like, Frank would come into the gym, he'd watch everyone training and sparring, and he'd be talking to Mick, and he'd say, who's ready now? And Mick would go, nah, they're not ready yet. You've got to come in a couple of years' time. And Frank would be there two years later to go, oh, how's he getting on now? And who does that anymore? Yeah. 
he used to drive around in a Jag, didn't he, Frank Maloney? Because I know somebody who, who went to fight for him and they were driving around London and you know one of them half a daily type Jags. Yeah. He was a character like that. <laughs> driving around in this old Daimler. <laughs> like some old spiv like half a daily. All right. That's what you need, Porky. I know, and it, yeah. I, I quite like Jags with the greedy on petrol. I'm a diesel man, no. aren't I, Terry? No, no. Yo, get yourself a Mercedes 450 SEL with the 6.9 <laughs> engine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, eight to a gallon. Uh, <laughs> a lot of criticism this evening on social media uh, regarding... Uh, we've got a list here. These people of today have done interviews in the space of five hours. With IFL and Boxing Social on a Sunday, Dave Allen, David Price, Fearon, Johnny Nelson, Macklin, you know, all, all the usual ones. And <laughs> basically, we know Daniel the Bar quit, but they've all given him a, a real hard time and come down real heavy on him, saying he's a quit. I don't think he quit. So this is my whole point. I don't think he quit. Maybe protected his... Well, what point I want to make is that not a peek out of these people was said about Anthony Joshua when he quit. And he went he in as bad a position as Dubois with his eye worry. Dave said he quit. Dave, you do? Hey. No, no, Dave said... Dave Allen yeah, yeah. He said if he perform like that, he should move away to an island. But the, but the rest of these here, they never they never said, oh, did the Tony Bell you all... But he hadn't been on IFL today, though, but... Point is, it's the cult now. But what people are forgetting is Coogan and these uh, these IFL, whoever whoever these IFL men are, to work with, and this Rob Tevitt, they're they're like steering it up, aren't they? So they've got a part to play in it as well because they're then going to want access to Daniel Dubois when he wins the world title or if he gets it back on track. And wouldn't that wouldn't that be detriment to them? Wouldn't they be in a bad position there or? Because they're like promoting this false, not false narrative, but I just think it's in bad taste. It was it a 50-50 fight before it started. We all picked who we wanted. We all said it was great. It weren't pay-per-view. Well done, Frank Warren. It weren't pay-per-view. Well done, Joyce and Dubois. And then we've got this from the matchroom gang setting about them. Is it a matchroom Queensby thing? Because like I've just said, nothing was said about Joshua, was it really? Well, it's two things. Number one, it's you know, team team Warren threw rocks at Joshua. Oh Williams. well, as well, he he would have won of them as well. Sorry, go on, sorry. Yeah, so so team Frank threw rocks at Joshua when he lost. You know, we, I mean, Porky, like, like that was your week. That might have been your greatest ever week, Porky. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that was the one week where everyone was just, we need the new Porky video. Now, how many was the six parter, wasn't it? Six parter, yeah, every day. Yeah, so. So you had your moment, and so I can understand why the Sky guys are now giving Dubois a bit of a kicking. I get it. Yeah. But it's in, for me, I'm like, fucking hell, like, all you guys giving him a kicking. Macklin took a body shot from Golovkin and didn't want anything. Like, he didn't even try and get up. You, you see how he was listening for the count, and when he knew that he couldn't get up in time, he tried to be a hero about it. He checked out after that body shot. Yeah. Uh, he checked out and he played to the audience. He quit, but we don't talk about that. Yeah. Johnny well, Nelson. Bell you, know, Johnny. Bell you against Stevenson. He, yeah, he bottled it. He he he, he pooed his, his pants. Turned his head in corner, didn't he? Yeah, he pooed his pants, and then he's got the cheek to criticize O'Hara Davis. Yeah, Johnny Nelson, Davis, didn't he? Yeah, Johnny Nelson couldn't quit because he was running around the perimeter of the ring. But there's nothing wrong with that. That's Johnny's style. What do you mean, Johnny Carlos De Leon? Yeah. You know that oh. fact, you know, they were throwing, you know, you get beer in them plastic beaker things. They were, oh, you thought, they were throwing full cans at Marvin Agler, weren't they? But Johnny Nelson were getting them thrown on him at that night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Leon, so. so I think, and, and it's like I said before, like there's, 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 a, there's a subtle nuance here where people say Dubois quit. And when I watched the fight, I watched it back again. Russ, I think he just shut down. You know, sometimes you can be so overloaded with whatever's going on in your head. The switches just go off. Yeah. And I think that's all that happened with him because I don't think emotionally he's been to that place before. 
He didn't turn his back. He didn't curl up. Uh, he didn't run off. He didn't do anything. He wasn't even going backwards in the fight. It's almost like he got touched. And I was talking to a friend of mine who had an orbital injury himself. And what he said was, it's not the physical pain that messes you up. It's that it throws your vision off. So you have no idea. Like, out of that side there, he'd have no idea of his bearings. Like, your equilibrium goes... And so he probably just, his brain just probably went, and if he'd been, yeah, if he'd, if he'd been allowed to have 10 seconds to get his, his thoughts together, he'd probably carried on. But his brain in that moment just went, nah, this is too much. And that's different from quitting because quitting for me comes from a place of fear. And I don't think that came from a place of fear. No. Well, only Daniel knows, doesn't he? But like I said, it was a great fight, and uh, it'll haunt him for the rest of his life. A bit like the the Duran one with Leonard, won't it? That yeah. haunted him for years. He could never shake it off. And Victor Ortiz, and they're not all going to be like Arthur Abraham, are they? Holding his head together, like in the uh, Edison Miranda fight, you know, his jaw. Yeah. That were one of the worst ones I've seen. That, and I think he had another one, didn't he, against Stig Litz. That were a bad one, but they stopped that, didn't they? Do you feel that the, Ian John Lewis should have stopped it earlier and noticed that the eye were really bad and referred it to the doctor? Or do you think that he were frightened because it were a brick-top show? I think he should have gone to the doctor. I think especially at the beginning of that round 10, I think that would have been the right thing to do. And do you think Ian John Lewis has slid under radar for not going to the doctor? Because of Dubois quit. You think Ian John Lewis might get some criticism because nobody's said a word about him, but yet again, he's involved in controversy, isn't he? I, I'll let him slide on this one. He, he's committed far bigger sins in the ring than that. But oh, my, my, God, we know about that, don't we? Yeah. I, I just think sometimes when you, when you have things easy for too long, and it's, it's, it's that word you used earlier, Russ, Sometimes you have to go through that adversity. Yeah. I don't think he'd been through that kind of adversity where... Like seasoned, where we like Joyce. Yeah, because, you know, a lot of people get to quit inspiring and they get to quit as an amateur and they know that feeling and they'll never do it again. Yeah. Right? All these guys who say they've never quit, at some point they have. Right? I don't care if it was your first ever spa or your fifth spa or your 500th. There's a point where you were just like, I can't do this. And you just quit. But you pulled yourself together, you carried on, you had a great career. The sad thing with Dubois is it seemingly happened in front of the hundreds of thousands of people. Froch once told me at his house, he says, when he were an amateur before he, he, a fight, he, he used to feel like he, he'd want to run, run a mile. He said, I just wanted to run away. He said, I'd be in the car with my trainer and we'd be going to this fight. <laughs> and he said, I'd just be thinking, what am I doing here? He just wanted to just get out of car and run home. So everybody goes yeah. through it, don't they? Man, you know us? Fucking hell, I remember. <laughs> you, you'd be in the gym on a Tuesday and it'd be like, everyone bring your sparring stuff on Thursday. And you're like, you'd have 48 hours to just dread sparring. And then you'd walk into the gym and it's Big Domac and Lardy and it's Neon Williams and it's Anthony Small and it's this guy and it's that guy. And everyone has shown up for that sparring. There's Martin Welsh and Danny Davis. Like Anthony Small's a serious guy, isn't he, Terry? Ah, oh, mate. Like, at, at his, when he, at, if you just keep it focused on boxing, at his best, I have his. Class. I remember, do you know what? This is Anthony Small for you. You'd be in the ring with Smallsy, right? And he'd go, I'm going to hit you with two left hooks. And I'm like, how are you going to do that? And then he'd move around. And the minute you drop that right hand, you just feel pop, pop. And he'd laugh at you. And then he'd move around again. He'd go, I'm going to hit you with four. And you're like, nah, he's not. And you throw a backhand to the body. Boom. And then he hit you with four hooks. And you're like, and you just be like, Smallsy, I hate you. But he hit so hard for a middleweight. Like, he, he was freakishly strong. Yeah, did, he, did his head go or something? Because one not he a bit of a loon him, that uh, Anthony Small? Didn't he join ISIS or something? Okay, so, like, I've known, I've known Smallsy, what, 15, 16 years? He's a really quiet, unassuming guy. Like, he, he was one of those guys. He boxed as a pro, but he qualified. Was it, he was either a plumber or a gas fitter. He was qualified. Like, he, he had a living. Mm. And then, 
something happened. I think sometimes what happens when you become successful, you get the wrong people around you. Now, you, you know the people I'm referring to, but yeah, yeah. there are a lot of Muslims around the boxing scene at that time. Yeah. And the thing with those guys is they kind of play at it, right? Yeah. Anthony Small's not a guy to play at anything. So once he got involved, he really got involved. And that's when he went south. Yeah. And it's hard because, like, you'd see Anthony Small, like I'd be shopping in Iceland or something, and I'd see Anthony Small... But you can't talk to him because you know he's got MI5 watching him. So you're like, I don't need to be on their radar. So it's like, yes, yes, Smalls, Smalls, they've got to go though. I've got to go, but we're going to chat soon, yeah? But let me tell you a little story about Anthony Small. This is how, you, how, how funny he is, right? He broke his ankle on a moped accident, Porky. And he came to our gym and he sparred for half an hour, didn't leave the ring. Sparred with a boot on. He had one leg and he sparred and people couldn't land on him. On one leg. Unbelievable, isn't it? But yeah, I did. I did hear that. Uh, well, I saw. I saw some videos. I'm going back a good few years now, and he sent messages to Frank Warren and all sorts on these videos, and he were dressed up in full radical outfit and all job lot, and he he were he were going Allah Akbar or something like that. You know, some Allah Akbar. Something like that, and that, yeah, that what Nazi and Mamid said in ring that time when he fought uh, Kevin Kelly or something. He was coming out with it with stuff like that and some really serious, serious sentences. And he looked a pretty scary guy, mate. I'm telling you, you wouldn't want him as your neighbor, would you, on a landing if you were living in a block of flats? You know, I'm but he's that. such a nice guy, like, know, Smalls, he's, he's such a he's a he's a warm hearted guy. I don't want him knocking on my door for a bottle of Tabasco sauce at one in the morning, though, Terry, in full radical outfit. You know what I mean? Ah, mate, he'd probably sit down and watch your... He'd probably tell you he's a big fan of Porky's Corner. <laughs> what do you reckon to that, Rocky? <laughs> oh, what's the, Porky's Corner? The official boxing podcast of ISIS. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine them all sat there in the cave? Ah, yes, this Porky. Porky is correct about everything. Yeah. Yes, Eddie, I wonder what happened Eddie, to that, Oh, sorry. Yeah, Eddie Heron is the new Satan. Porky is correct. <laughs> what, uh, what happened to Anthony Small now? And where is he now then? Because he was tipped to do massive things. He nearly fought Ryan Rhodes at the press conference and everything. Would have beaten Ryan. Would he? Yeah. In a good fight. Would have, would have, would have stopped Ryan Rhodes. You reckon? Yeah. yeah he hit been. too hard. He hit too hard. Like, I had. 20 kilos on him. Well, I remember we'd spy and I had 20 kilos on him and he'd hit you in 16s or 14s and you just see this white light and you're like, and you just have to say to yourself, stay up, stay up. And he could just do that for fun. Yeah. Accurate, hit hard, was strong, was quick. Mate, so, you know what? The wrong people got his ear in boxing. It goes back to what I said before about boxing loves to separate you from the thing that keeps you stable because then it controls you. And yeah. so when he was controlled by certain people in boxing and they were really forcing this whole Muslim thing down his throat, he embraced it fully yeah. and he took it to a level they weren't ready for. Yeah. Well, but, well, we wish I'm finished small, uh, all the best. Let's just, let's hope that he's not, uh, doing anything too heavy. Whatever he's involved in, because he's a pretty serious guy, isn't he? <laughs> I, I pray for him. Like, you know what? Whenever I see him, like, it's always a quick, quick touch of the fist or a quick hug. And I'm like, and I always say to him, bro, it's too hot to be talking for too long. But listen, man, I hope I see you on the other side. And when, I do. I pray that one day, like, he rediscovers who he really is. Yeah, when you see him, mate, what you're trying to say really is when you see him, you burn rubber. You just say, oh, I've got to go. I'll see you later. <laughs> You're laid around because if you call it, you can't get away from him. Oh no, I, I probably still can, but I just don't want MI five booting this door down, Porky. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot a lot of that goes on around your area, isn't there? Yeah, you've got to be careful. Yeah. Well, uh all right then. Uh let's just finish off on uh what you think about Dennis's show. <sighs> I want Dennis to be successful. I, so I, I messaged Den not long ago uh, because I said to him, mate, if they're going to allow crowds of a thousand in, why don't you just do it in an arena? He's like, no, nah, I'm committed to the drive-through. 
So I was like, okay, I wish him all the best. Um, so, oops, sorry. Uh, main event looks decent. So Harvey Horn is. I don't know. Is he still Mark Tibbs or no, no, Harvey Horn's off at parties, but he's been pulled off. Oh, who's replaced him? Some Mexican guy. I don't know. So, oh, why, why is Harvey Horn off? I don't know. They, they couldn't get it for British, and uh, so it was going to be IBF European, but they couldn't come. They couldn't come agree terms, so that's off. It's some Mexican guy now, and Cash Alley's opponent, Danny Whitaker, got knocked out last night, so he won't be able to fight because it's a twenty-eight day laydown after a knockdown, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, what, what about Smedley's lad? Put Cash in with Smedley's lad. Can't, we, we, no, uh, I don't. The I, heavyweight. Oh, uh, I forgot his name now. Mark someone, isn't it? Carl Baker. Is it Carl Baker with Smedley? Yeah, I think I think Nick. One, I think one of Chris's sons was training him. Carl Baker. Uh, he's from Sheffield, isn't he? But Chris has got a couple of prospects, hasn't he? But I don't know who they are. I'm going up to see him this week, but I don't know who uh, who his prospects are. He started again, and he's had a couple of years out. Two and a half year out, and he's he's starting again. So, where's his gym? Uh, sh- I had it wrote down here somewhere. I don't know. He's, he'll text me it tomorrow if I can't find it. Uh, uh, living legend, living legend from Sheffield. He's back on boxing scene. Uh, putting his son about. Shout out to Chris Smedley, aka the Don. Yeah, aka the the man the ladies all want. Yeah, I'd like to see Liam come back. Liam Cameron as middleweight. Ah, super mid for him, man. You seen the size of his neck? He's put a bit of timber on, but he got down to 158 when he fought Sheedy. Ah, oh, man, he ain't doing that again. Yeah, yeah. So, do you need all from Ingram? Nah, I haven't heard anything from Ingram for ages. Is he still yeah. doing his thing? Yeah, he still does his thing. He's, he, I have a look at his channel every now and then. He does a lot of gaming stuff, you know. I don't really understand all that, but he's quite... That's where, he's that's where the future is. He's a positive guy, uh, Ingram, actually. I quite, I've got a soft spot for him. Yeah, he, when, I, when I met him, he was all right. I've got nothing against Ingram. Good guy. He's from your area, isn't he? Acne, is it? He's from... Is he? Well, I thought he was from Ireland. No, he, he's living over here. He lives in... Uh, I forget now. Woking or somewhere near to see us, I forget now. It's Worthing. Worthing. He lives in Worthing, but he was living in Ireland. He married an American woman, and he's living in Worthing now. But he's from Hackney originally. Oh, Worthing. I was there this summer. You know, Worthing's really weird. So here's a travel tip for anyone. Yeah. If you don't want to go to Brighton because it's too busy, just drive 20 minutes along the coast to Worthing. Right? Yeah. Beaches are empty. I mean, it was really nice there. Food's overpriced, unfortunately, but really, really nice when it's hot. Yeah. Well, that won't bother Ingram. He's a vegan. <laughs> ah. So, all right. Then. Well, listen, it's been a pleasure you coming on, Terry. I hope you're well. No worries, mate. And uh, I'll get this out tomorrow. We've got no intros and no endings for videos now. That's So that's going to be put on this tomorrow. Just a bit first one. So. Ray! Ray! Hey, right, no end, no intro, no ending to celebrate. What was I going to say? Are you are you going to Dennis's show? No, I'm not going now. AJ Hobson, he's going. He asked me if I'm going. I said no. But the the guy who owns Car Showroom next door, he sponsors Cash. He says, he says I'm going with him in his Ferrari. But I said oh, I don't know if I want to go. Why not? If you're not been really involved in some, it'd be I look a bit sad when I turning up. I can go for us. You just you're just there to appreciate the boxing. Yeah, well, I, we don't know if it's going to happen, actually, because we're in Tier 3, aren't we? So there's a lot going on behind the scenes. So I don't know, but uh, we'll, we'll see, won't we? But if I wanted to go, I could just go up and just um, come in that way. I won't even have to pay, but we'll see. I've got a bit of pride about this, then, haven't I? You know what I'm like when I spit my dummy out? <laughs> nah, you're stubborn, man. You, know, you, you, know, you, <laughs> you, you leave too many opportunities on the table by being stubborn, Porky. Well, it's, it's the miners son in me, I'm afraid. Coal might have with a collier coal face work. I've just, in fact, I've just found my birth certificate here and uh, so I'm going to hand my passport in tomorrow and get that uh, sorted. But you've got to put birth certificate in me and it says uh, colliery coal face work, you know, from my dad's occupation. Now, instead yeah. Of, it's, I've got a bit of that in me, I think. So. But, no worries, but listen, you take care. Big shout out to your pod, Terry, the beautiful podcast, Beyond Boxing. Is it episode Cheers, 
today, episode five. Is it out? Seven, mate. One episode seven. seven. Episode seven. Yeah, uh, the last one with the Kell Brook one, six, wasn't it? About the trainers, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought that was a good one, that. Uh, and uh, regarding Crawford, how the, he's he, he's uh, got a good style and they, they had, they've got a lot to the game more than British kids, haven't they? So I thought that was very good. Well, it's interesting because I did that one and then I watched what happened yesterday and I thought, yeah, perfect. <laughs> there you go. That's everything I was talking about. But what I'm going to do now, I'm going to put yours, I'm going to upload this, send it to Cameron, uh, uh, West Yorkshire, and I'm going to put yours on and just nod off with you on. I usually nod off. I have to Ready. do it in the morning. Ready, <laughs> <Like that. laughs> <laughs> Big shout out to Mick Whale and Josh Whale. Hope you're well. Always. So their gym should be opening this week, so that's good. They've, uh, they've had a rough year, but... Good, sh- good, big shout out to them. It's, let's see if we can get uh, some kids turning over. So, all right, tell me. I you hope so. Care. All right, mate. Let's yeah, speak to you soon. Take care. Good evening. See you, mate. Right, mate. Bye bye. Right. <clears throat> well, that was uh, Terry. Uh, and I enjoyed having him on. He's uh, very knowledgeable. We don't always agree on everything, actually. Uh, but he. Uh, his vocabulary, or whatever the word is, is a lot better than mine because he's university educated. Uh, but you know, it's this is this pro, this what I'm doing here. These this show or episodes or channel or whatever it, this concept, it's for everybody to come on. There's a lot of people leave comments and I ask them to come on. A lot, of, a lot of them do. A lot of them don't. Uh, a lot of them make appointments to come on and then they let me down. Well, if you let me down. You don't get another chance, but it's nothing personal. But we're planning on doing 12 a week, is it? Hang on a minute. 10 a week. I'm going to do 10 Zooms a week. 10, sorry. 10 Zooms a week. That's what I want to do. That's 40 a month. And that's too much, isn't it? I don't know this month, 32. So there'll be about 35 videos this month or 45 or something. I don't know. But maybe 10 a lot, a lot a week. I don't know, two a day, five days. I don't know, but if we get a video a day out, that's good. Isn't it? But point I want to make is that all the people have got a lot to say for yourselves and are very critical of what we do on here and slag people off because of what they wear or what they look like or what they've said. Why don't you come on? I'm not goading you. Why don't you come on? Now, like we're doing now, and you can say your bit and we can debate and see what you've got to say. Don't be shy. Get yourselves on here. That includes jewels. Uh, what? What is it? Porky's missing teeth. Hey. <laughs> oh, we've got a laugh, haven't we? But anybody's welcome. If you do want to come on, it's Porky Corner at mail dot com. It's not Porky's. It's Porky. Porky Corner at mail dot com. Send me an email saying I want to come on, and tell me when you're available. And I'll have somebody send you a link and slot you in. It'll either be in the morning. I like to do one at 11 o'clock and one at six or eight o'clock. Sometimes it's six and eight, but I like to do at least two a day. And then odd day I might miss one. All right. Uh, so, all right. So thanks for tuning in. It's been a long and the sun is a lot. Mm, got an hour and 30 minutes. So that's a good one for you. All right, so peace out.